idols of boys who have carved ways in any ability that some consider to be unnatural. Is it possible to learn this power? Not from a Jedi. Good morning. Okay, if that's what our starting level is, we're going to have to work harder, all right? Good morning. morning. That was nice. See, that's good. That's good. You know, I am more excited about this week than any other week in this series, not because the other weeks aren't going to be awesome. They absolutely are. But I think the thing uh, we're going to talk about here in the second week of Advent, in in the second week of our new series, is something that, that applies to and affects every single one of us in one way or another. And so today we are going to read another Christmassy passage together. Last week we began by reading uh, the Christmas story and from the most common account in Luke chapter 2. And this week we're going to read another passage that that we associate uh, with Christmas. We commonly tie it to Christmas even though these events uh, maybe occurred in, within the first 40 days of Jesus' life, all the way up until possibly uh, he was two years old. And we, we see these words in Matthew chapter 2. And I want you to uh, just listen as I read this familiar story. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was born. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, there's a number of things that we could focus on from this passage that would certainly tie in with our series. We have long trips. Uh, We had uh, a long trip last week. We have insecure kings who think that the way to protect their power is by, by eliminating babies who, who pose a threat to them. We have interesting astrological events, right? Stars appearing in skies and even dreams where warnings are given to us. But the two things that I want us to hyper focus in on today are these magi or these wise men and their gifts. Because 
This is something that impacts all of us in one way or another. And I want, I want to give you guys today the gift of freedom and the gift of permission as we talk about the weight of gold. The weight of gold. Now, when, when you're a kid, as presents start to appear under the Christmas tree, can everybody kind of remember that? Do you have kind of a conception of that happening? When presents start to appear, so maybe it's just you, and maybe you have like a brother or sister, and a couple gifts show up under the tree. Which one do you hope has your name on it? The big one, right? You almost don't even care what it is. You just want the big one. It's like, really? You want the new stove or the washing machine or whatever? Uh, um, it's, it's in the small one, we can, you know, I don't want the small one. I want the big one. Now, you get a little older and maybe, you know, maybe you are a, a woman who is hoping that this year is your boyfriend becomes more than your boyfriend, right? And so wh- which size gift would you want? The, isn't it crazy how it changes? It is, isn't it? And, and, and for some of us, for some of us in this room, I know some of you in this room right now, even seeing gifts makes you nauseous, right? And here's what I mean by that. I mean, there are things that your loved ones want and that you would love to get for them, but you can't afford it. And so even seeing gifts sitting here stresses you out. But what if, what if, what if you can't afford them? Yeah, I could, I could buy them that, but you know what? If I do, I know that, that the neighbors or, or those people or even other family members will go, oh, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you always spoil your kids. I can't believe, I can't believe. And so we have that sitting on our shoulders. What if the only way that we can afford them is by taking something that looks like this and going like this and then hoping in the days, weeks, months, and maybe even years ahead we can figure out how to cover it. That has its own unique set of stresses, doesn't it? Actually, I don't have one of these anymore uh, after going through FTU. Um, so I actually lifted this one off of our special guest today. So can I use this one, Rob? Okay, you can use Darth's. I'm, I'm not advocating stealing a promise. W- and what if you have the money, but you know that the gifts like this are only going to reinforce and celebrate materialism and will have nothing at all to do with Jesus. Man, isn't this kind of a stressful thing? So these realities and this stress, this weight of gold, are all a huge part of the dark side of Christmas, aren't they? I mean, it doesn't matter if you have money or you need money, you can buy presents, you can't afford presents. Every which way, if we start focusing on stuff like this, it becomes stressful. Some of you are stressed out today uh, because we are inside of three weeks to Christmas and you have purchased no presents and you don't have the money to buy presents and you kind of feel a little bit like a failure. Your kids may not even have asked you for anything, but you still feel like you're letting them down. Some of you are stressed out because you desperately, desperately, desperately want this time of year to be about more to your family, to your kids, to your loved ones, than just one more material possession. And for some of us, we've even gotten to the place where, where it sort of feels like our, our family or our friends care more about the nice things we're able to buy for them than about us. And isn't that an awesome way to feel at Christmas? And so that one more thing we buy maybe doesn't even help maybe it even hurts so whether you have money or need money the weight of gold can be crushing to all of us and so here's the thing i think that this story we read has some things to tell us that'll give us hope and freedom i think that our lives the things that that we've all just commonly experienced can give us hope and freedom and i actually think star wars can help us as well so god today i just pray as as we look to you uh, Lord, I just know, I know it. There's people in this room who are stressed out today. God, there are people who are stressed out because they want to be able to do things for their kids or family members or friends, and they don't know where the money's coming from. Lord, I know there's people in this room who are stressed out because they can afford to buy a whole bunch of stuff, but 
They want the, the holiday to be more about just stuff. They want people to see you. And so, God, I just pray that you would give us some wisdom today and meet with us as, uh, as we share this time together. Speak to us, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. So here's the deal. We're going to start somewhere different. And I want to begin by saying something to you that maybe you haven't heard before. The message of the church at this time of year, like largely, I mean, sort of every church you would walk into, if you've walked into a church and they, they were talking about, you know, uh, Christmas and money and gifts and all those kind of things, the message has largely, uh, largely been spend less and give more. Amen. No, no, no. Uh, it, like, like if we spend, that's a bad thing, right? And, and the problem with that is that, you know, you, you're out and you're sort of good-hearted and you're just wanting to do nice things for people you love. And you can feel guilty, can't you? Like going to the store to get a present for your kid or your, your son. You feel guilty. Oh, I don't know if I should really be doing this. And so here's the thing. Let me be one of the first to say expensive gifts are not inherently bad. There's nothing wrong with buying an expensive gift. In fact, we have biblical precedent here for the celebration of the birth of Jesus with expensive gifts, don't we? I mean, didn't these magi bring expensive gifts? We, we see this here. And so after these wise men or magi show up where Jesus is, we see these words in the second half of verse 11. It says this, They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So gold is the first gift that is mentioned. Now, we don't know how much gold that he received, but here's what you need to know. One brick of gold, like if I had a brick, I couldn't hold it like this. I'd probably have to hold it like this, right? One brick of gold in today's value is worth about $325,000. Do you ever wonder that when you see like one of those like heist movies and they're like loading all these bricks of gold? Like I wonder how much money that is. One brick, three hundred. I think if I had about three bricks... Like, I'd be good, right? Like, that'd be awesome. Anybody else want three bricks? I want three bricks. Um, so they, they, they brought this. Gold was probably more highly valued in Jesus' day. So however much they gave him, uh, it would have been worth more then. And then the second gift they give is frankincense. And frankincense is an aromatic resin that's obtained by cutting the bark of certain types of trees. And the most popular use for frankincense is the priests would use it in their incense in worship because it had such an incredible smell. And so they would burn it in worship um, and, it would, and it would fill the place with a wonderful odor and it would rise kind of as an offering to God. And it was very highly valued as well. Not as valuable as gold, but very highly valued. And then the third gift was myrrh which is quite a bit like frankincense. It's different kinds of trees, but it's also resin uh, taken from inside the bark. And it had a ton of uses in biblical times. They, they, they used it as incense and perfume. But in the Bible, myrrh is used most frequently um, as, a, as an embalming fluid or as a burial spice to sort of cover up the stench of a decaying body. This is, this is how it was used. So these magi gave expensive gifts. Now, they were, they were kind of decreasing in value, but they were all very valuable things. And they did this in celebration of the birth of King Jesus. But it's, it's more important to remember something that was true then, and is still true for us now. The meaning trumps the expense. The meaning behind the gifts that we give is more important. It trumps the expense. So when we think about the three gifts here in the scriptures, in, in, in the Bible, gold is associated with divinity and kingship. So the very first gift that the wise men give, the gift of gold, it's basically declaring that Jesus is, is deity, that Jesus himself is God. That's what they're saying. That's the meaning of behind this gift of gold they're saying this little baby that was born we are recognizing that he is god it's kind of a cool thing right and then frankincense we see that uh, this gift symbolized priesthood okay so the priests would use this as, as incense in worship 
and it would fill the place and it would rise up. And so as they were giving this to God or to Jesus when he was a baby, in essence, they were saying, hey, Jesus is the ultimate priest. If you want to know God, you want to connect with God, you want to be forgiven of your sins, there's no other person you can talk to. There's no other way to get this done than Jesus. Jesus is is a priest, and so that's the meaning behind that gift. And myrrh is is interesting, too, because the gift of myrrh, remember, it symbolized suffering and death that our Messiah would have to face. Do you remember this? It's kind of a little interesting thing. When Jesus is a baby, he's given this gift of valuable myrrh. Do you remember when he was hanging on the cross, they tried to give him wine that had myrrh in it, soaked in a sponge to, to numb his pain? So that Jesus could, in effect, just sort of fall asleep and not have to endure the suffering of crucifixion. But what does he do? He refuses that. Because he's willing to go through difficult things for you and for me to give us the ultimate gift at Christmas time and in our lives. So a meaningful gift trumps an expensive gift every time. I want you to say this with me. We're going to break it up. I'll say it. You say it back. Okay, ready? Ready? A meaningful gift trumps an expensive gift. And then say this part like you mean it. Ready? Every time. This is totally true. Man, a meaningful gift always trumps an expensive gift. We, we, we need to understand this. We need to get this, not just kind of say it. So, like, um, let me give you kind of, we, we try to incorporate little things, even if they're not noticed. Do you ever notice, like, we don't like going halfway on anything here at New Hope, right? Like, if we're bringing Darth Vader in, we want to bring Darth Vader in, right? Um, and so uh, one of the things, some of you may not have noticed this, but our Advent wreath has the, the candle holders are actually lightsaber hilts. And, uh, and you might go, well, how much did that cost? Well, I'm glad you asked me. Uh, we actually had the high school, this was like one of the, smaller original kind of test things the high school actually printed uh 3d printed these hilts for us and we painted them and figured out a way to put the candles in and this is kind of a cool thing too we were having a hard time finding a christ candle and my wife bethany she's like well, we have our unity candle from our wedding and i'm like we're not using that she's like i already unwrapped it and and at first i was like mad at her like i was kind of the girl like oh we should keep that as sentimental and she was like no we can but then I thought, how it's kind of an honor to use our candle for the Christ candle. I think I sort of like, like that. I think that's pretty cool. But, but so, you know, so this cost us nothing to have these made and about seven bucks in paint to do this. And I think that is pretty awesome. See, it's about the meaning, the symbolism, way more than how much it costs. Bethany's mom, Bethany would talk growing up, was like a stickler about this kind of thing. She tried... Be- with Bethany and her twin brother and sister, um, she always tried to buy for all three kids to the closest penny, right? Like, we, we want to spend the exact same amount, you know, because nobody can be valued over the other, you know. And, and, it, and I, I sort of say that like it's inherently bad, and I don't want to sound like that. But here's the thing, like, I, I want to get my kids something that's meaningful to them. And I don't care if the thing that's meaningful to one of my children is a heck of a lot cheaper than the thing that's meaningful to the other one. I don't want them to grow up thinking about things like, well, I made out better than you. I mean, I don't really like my stuff, but mom and dad spent more money on me. (laughs) Right? Like, I don't want to do that because I think when we do it, it's an exercise in missing the point. And we waste money, right? Because I got... My, my son or daughter or my friend or whoever the thing that was meaningful to them, but it wasn't as much as I spent on somebody else, so I'm just going to buy them a whole bunch of useless stuff to make it up so we can be close to the same dollar amount. My parents, for years, would tell the story of the Christmas where my two kind of main gifts where they got me, this will sort of show my age because I don't think they even call them this anymore, but a ghetto blaster, right? Um, so I got it. I got it little stereo to put in my room, and the other gift was a chemistry set. Now, I don't know how much these things cost, but I know that the stereo cost a lot more, and the chemistry set didn't cost very much. 
And my parents thought that as soon as we were done opening stockings and presents and had a meal together, that I would go to my room and I would, again, showing my age, like put my cassette tapes in and listen to the radio and do all that kind of stuff. They just thought this is going to be like the home run gift. But you know what the interesting thing, the chemistry set that was probably 20 bucks? I spent days and weeks and months sitting downstairs at a card table playing that with that thing, making different experiments every single day. The thing that was meaningful to me was not the thing that cost the most money. So there is nothing inherently wrong with expensive gifts, right? But meaningful gifts are better no matter how much or how little they cost. But here's the caution we all have to hear and receive, okay? Because this, this one's important. The stress of debt is bad. The stress of debt is bad. Now think about this. Who were these wise men? The Bible doesn't go into detail about them. Most scholars suggest that these wise men, also called magi, were astrologers or scholars with some knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures. They may also have been uh, Zoroastrian priests. If you can say that three times fast, there's a prize. I may give you this lightsaber hilt. Um, uh, And they were known for their study of the stars. And they likely came from Persia or Arabia. So they were wealthy. These guys were, were wealthy. They had a lot of wealth. I guarantee you none of them had to swipe or go into debt to bring these or buy these meaningful gifts for Jesus. Now, as difficult as the guilt of provision may be, the stress of debt will push you and I farther into the dark side for a way longer period of time. Here's the thing. If it's a tough year and you have to tell your kids or someone else, hey, we're just, let's do it differently, or we're just going to get a gift for one person, or you know, we're not going to buy gifts this year. You know what? I get that that's a difficult moment. That, that nobody likes. But guess what? As soon as the moment's done, everybody's cool and you can have a good Christmas. But if you buy something you can't afford and, and you have to carry that for weeks and months and even years, that pushes us deep into the dark side, doesn't it? I mean, some of us, we don't even open the credit card statement anymore because you're afraid you're going to see that little thing that says, if you make the minimum payment, you will pay this off in 97,000 years. Right? Right? And, uh, and, and it freaks us out. It's difficult. So here's two personal tests for you. If you're like, well, sh- sh- I don't know. Can I afford this or what should I do? So just a couple practical things to think about. So um, if, if you have to swipe in order to get it and you don't know exactly when or how long it will take to pay it off, don't. Rob, you should say amen to this. This, like, ties in well with kind of what you, right? If, if you're like, this is the only way, but I have to, and I'll figure it out at some point in the future, weeks and months and years in the future. Don't. Don't do it. And then here's the other one. If you still haven't fully paid off the presents you bought last Christmas or maybe even the Christmas before, don't. Like, just don't. It's not that important. So, Rob, we, we've, we've talked a little bit about the, w- this, this account of these magi and their gifts. The Bible's maybe helped us a little bit, and you've told us some, some stories just from life. Maybe that's helped us a little bit. But, but you said that Star Wars is going to help us today, too. How in the world can, can Star Wars help us? I'm glad you asked me that question. Um, every little boy, the first time we saw Star Wars, we just wanted two things, right? If we could have two things, we wouldn't need anything else for the rest of our lives. What was the first one? A lightsaber, right? If we could just have a lightsaber. I actually have a lightsaber now because we had to get one for this series. Woo! Yeah, and here's the other one, right? We just wanted to be able to use the force. I mean, if we could just Jedi and mind trick people. I mean, every time in a movie where one of those guys waves his hand and says something and someone's like Jedi and mind tricked, it's like, that's awesome. Now, I I just want to, I want to give you guys a perfectly 100% honest confession. As an adult, I'm actually glad in some ways that I can't use the force. Because here's why. If I was a Jedi, there's a 100% chance I would use the force inappropriately. Right? And so would you. 
we would all be using the force on everybody we knew to kind of, you know, have life look exactly like we wanted it to look like. So I want to show you one of my favorite all-time scenes from Star Wars that illustrates the next point. Luke is, is on the planet Dagobah. Uh, Obi-Wan, after he, he sort of died and he became part of the force, you know, his, his ghost kind of is speaking to Luke all the time, and he tells Luke, you got to go to this planet, and, and you have to continue your training with this Jedi master named Yoda. And I'm so committed to the teaching this week, I actually, I wore my Yoda socks. Check it out. They actually have ears. You like those? Come on. That's right. That's how committed we are here at New Hope, all the way. Um, so, so when Luke arrives on Dagobah, there's some issues and, and interference and things, and so he crashes his X-Wing in the swamp, and he thinks it's impossible to get his X-Wing out. And so Yoda's trying to talk to him about this and teach him, and there's also more stress because Luke is learning and about ready to learn that a couple of his close friends are in trouble, and so he actually is feeling the stress of, I need to leave my training early to try to go help them, um, but his, his plane's in the swamp, and he thinks it's impossible, and there's nothing he can do, so check out this clip. at me. Like me, the massage, do you? Hmm? Mm. And where are you today's knight? For my ally is the Force, and the powerful ally it is. Like the breeze it makes it grow. Its energy surrounds your body and binds you. Luminous beings, though, be not this true matter. You must weave the force around you, you, bring you be with me. Love everyone. Yes, even let me share. You want the impossible.
<laughs> Come on, that's awesome. Hey, can I say how proud I am of so many of you who have sent me messages saying, hey, we, we started watching the series or watching it machete style. That's a very nerdy thing to do, and I'm very proud of you for that. I love that, right? I can't believe it. That's why you fail. Now, that's good, but when we apply this to our finances, it gets us in trouble, right? If we just believe, we can make it happen. So let me say it this way. Lift only what you can lift. Huh? Luke couldn't lift it yet, right? He could barely budge it. Yoda could totally lift it. Magi brought gold. Many of us, most of us, don't have gold to bring. So apply this principle to Christmas, and you will avoid the path to the dark side. Uh, there, there are some of you here today, you know, who you can, you can afford to buy what you want. You could actually buy an Apple Watch for everybody who's on your list if you wanted to. Some of you. Some of you are like, really? There's people like that in this room? Can you tell me who they are? I don't know who you are. But, but, it, but um, you know, some of you could do that. Others of us, you know, we might be able to buy two or three of those if we did this and figured it out later. And then there's some of us in the room that, you know what, um, you have like no money and you have no credit or everything you have is maxed out that you couldn't even buy one for yourself if you wanted to. That's not even a possibility. So here's the deal. If you can afford one for everyone and you think it will help them see Jesus, buy them one. Do it, right? Because there's nothing wrong with giving us an expensive gift. In fact, add me to your list. I would like the 42 millimeter space black with the rubber sports band. Just kind of me mental note there. Um, <laughs> uh, but here's the deal. If you can afford it, but you believe it will not accomplish any real good, save your money or use your money differently. If there's no way on the planet you can afford it, well, then you don't need to hear me tell you anything because no matter what you would or wouldn't do, you don't have the capacity right now to do anything. But hear me. If you're there, hear me in this. We've all been there at one point, right? We've all not had any capacity. You don't need to feel bad about that, and you don't need to let that place push you to making bad decisions that will take you weeks and months and even years to recover from. But the people I worry about, and, and I'm in this category too, are those of us who really don't have the cash, but we could swipe and figure it out later. And our culture doesn't make it any easier on us, does it? So I want to show you guys a current commercial. Most of us have seen this dozens of times, if not hundreds of times. I don't even have a hooked up TV at my house, and I've seen this commercial a hundred times. Uh, so, uh, so check this out. Has anyone seen Steve? A very is at the top of the Christmas power rankings. Because when you enter Best Buy, it means you're gifting on all cylinders. It means you're not elfing around. It means you're buying gifts people really want. All with the guru-like guidance of our helpful blue shirts. Because when you give tech, people won't just love it. They'll love you. Win the holidays at Best Buy. Wow. Amazing music. Catchy slogan, inspiring because it speaks to what every one of us wish, right? That we could just buy whatever we wanted and afford to give stuff to everyone that we know and love. But win the holidays? I mean, come on. They won't just love it. If you buy me this expensive thing, I will love you? This is terrible theology. It's a terrible message, and it has nothing to do with the birth or the celebration of the birth of Jesus. I was talking about this at staff meeting this week, and one of the staff members said, oh, there's this great reading that ties perfectly with this, and I want to read, read you these words. It's entitled The Crusty Sage, and it's a little bit edgy, but hang in there. Quit buying crap you can't afford just because it's Christmas. Sheesh! Oh, 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 but it's Christmas. It's a special time of the year. I know we're in debt overall, but it's Christmas, and that only comes once a year. And you're an idiot. Seriously. The sage says it in love. The sage also says in love that if you spend $150 on your kid for Christmas when you don't have $150, you're not only giving your kid a neato nano, you're giving your kid a gift that keeps on giving. The gift of foolishness. 
surrounded by beautiful lights and the scent of pine and fudge, the gift of foolishness on display etched in their memory. Ah. Yes, Target and Apple and Best Buy don't advertise many $30 gifts, and they've ratcheted up the expectation level for Christmas, but last time I checked, your will remains free. This means you don't have to be an idiot. Yes, your parents may have overspent every year as you grew up. Yes, they may have, uh, uh, they may have been baby boomers seeking to atone for parental guilt for one reason or another. Yes, there may have been stacks of presents under your tree. Yes, you think this is the way Christmas is supposed to be. Yeah? So what? Christmas is not supposed to be you buying stuff you don't have money for. Sorry, if you're a dad and feel bad because you can't spend hundreds on everyone, tell them and that you don't have the money for it and you'll still have a great Christmas. If that makes you feel bad, man up. You're being bullied by a bunch of advertising majors. Gee, you're in debt? How'd that happen? This is a mystery. Someone call a CSI unit. Maybe they can figure out what happened. Maybe they can piece it together. Or maybe you just but bought a bunch of crap. Maybe you should stop it. Maybe Christmas isn't special at all. Maybe it's just the latest excuse to overspend. Gee, huh, wow. You think? Okay, we're in debt, and yeah, we did buy a $1,200 TV, but it's not that simple because sometimes, no, it is that simple. Sorry, next. But every one of my kids, uh, uh, my kids' school gets tons of expensive gifts like 360s and Wii's and stuff, and are you in debt? Well, yes, but it's not that simple. No, it is that simple. But it's not realistic to spend only $20 per person in this day and age, and why, it's, it's just not that simple, and... Wah. I think that's kind of if we saying if we behave like this, we're babies. If you don't have the money for it, you don't buy it. Don't act like your kids need an iPod either. It has nothing to do with needs or even your kid, really. And it has everything to do with you. Your desire to have some kind of perfect Christmas, your guilt, your insecurities, your conflict avoidance, your expectations, and you know, just generally, you. Bottom line, you wish you a Merry Christmas. But didn't the wise men bring gold to baby Jesus and fancy myrrh and stuff? Uh, that was extravagant, and they were royalty. You think they used the Discover card? Yeah, but Christmas, isn't Christmas in the Bible? And no, don't do that. Now, I understand the butts and the tension. I understand uh, not having the extra money and all that stress. But the principle still applies. Only lift what you can lift, and don't let some 24-year-old marketing student or your kid's friend's parents who are overspending for their children or the whining voices of your children who can't live without that thing that they will forget about 7.2 hours after it's open. Talk you into lifting more than you're able to. Here's the thing. In my house, we buy our kids one present. We do. Last year, Christopher got a little uh, Minecraft Lego set. And Liam got a little activity table that now Dexter has started to chew and made his toy too. But it's like, like A, B, red, blue, that kind of thing. That was it. And guess what? There, there, there's been no averse effects. In, in some ways, there may be more. The things that we give away for Angel Tree, we give more to every single person who receives than either of my kids receive at Christmas time. Um, and, and, so, so, and that's not being prescriptive. I'm just saying I've done it, and, and my kids are still fine and normal and you know, probably still spoiled. So, 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 Rob, what should I do? Well, I'm glad you asked. I want to give you a couple quick things as we wrap up today that I think will be helpful um, for us to walk out of this place knowing that we can do these things and every one of us can afford to do these things. So here's number one. Worship is a better gift. I don't care what you can or can't afford. Worship is a better gift. Watch what the first half of verse 11 says. It says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. You know, the thing that amazes me at this time of year when so many non-church people come to church, it amazes me how many Christians prioritize everything over worshipping Jesus. It's one of the reasons we offer a 3, 5, 7, uh, and 11. It's why our 3, 5, and 7 are rocking. 
and the 11 o'clock is more of a candlelight because we have Darth Vader's early ones, and, and, you know, it's just totally different experiences to help. This week, the banners will go up out front. Uh, there'll be articles, uh, p- ads in the newspaper. We've given invite cards at all the doors. We just want to make it as easy as possible for everyone to come to church and experience Jesus. And I don't care if it's here or somewhere else. If you're somewhere else traveling with family, make worshiping Jesus a priority. Teach your kids and your family the importance of worshiping Jesus this Christmas, not just sitting somewhere overeating and watching too many Hallmark movies. But there's one more gift that's even better, and every one of us can afford to give it. Do you want to know what the best gift is? And we have biblical case studies for this, because here's the thing. Last week we talked about the shepherds. What did the shepherds give? They gave themselves, right? Like they didn't have anything. Maybe they could have given a sheep, but they didn't have anything. They gave themselves. The wise men, we like to focus on the expense of the gift or even the meaning of the gift, but ultimately they came from a long way. What did they give? The gift of themselves, right? They gave, they gave presents. Presents is the real gift. Our presents. So if you are working a ton of extra to, to afford gifts and you have no time with your kids, stop it. Because you are giving them something that doesn't matter and robbing them of the thing they will remember forever. The things I remember about every Christmas are not even one present I've ever received. But it's time with my friends and time with my family. It's meals we shared and games we played. It's not a present. So, so maybe you can't afford a giant present like this to give to somebody. But could you go to the store and get a free box and make it into a fort that you could play with your kid in? We could all do this, right? We can all give the gift of presents, and then, then it's not the free box that becomes the gift, but it's you, right? You are the gift. And come on, isn't this the very message of Christmas? Emmanuel, God with us. God didn't come with iPods. God came to give himself, to give present. So so this year at Christmas, when you are tempted to shoulder the weight of gold, decide now in this moment what you're going to focus on. Are you going to focus on what you wish you had? Are you going to focus on what you wish you could afford to buy? Or are you going to focus on what Jesus has done and the gift that he is? Are you going to, are you going to focus on the fact that you get to celebrate this gift that Jesus is with some people who love you? and who are loved by you. In essence, this is what it boils down to. You can focus on the Death Star or the Christ Star. Did you guys notice the Death Star up in the corner of our slide? And there's actually an Imperial spaceship being pulled by AT-AT walkers, if you can see that up there. It's, it's just a magical Christmassy thing. I know when I say it like this, are you going to focus on the Death Star or the Christ Star? I mean, we're all like, well, when you put it that way, it sounds easy. I know it's not easy. I know when the the expectations of Christmas and the emotions of Christmas push in on us, it's not easy, but it is that clear. Lift only what you are able to lift. Keep your focus, your worship, and your eyes on Jesus. Spend more time than money with those you love this Christmas. And let Jesus keep you from this seductive area of the dark side. I want to pray for us. If you just bow your heads and close your eyes. And I I, I just want to ask, because again, I get it. I get that there's a bunch of us in this place that are feeling stressed out. Again, maybe it's because you don't have enough to do what you want. And for you, maybe it's because you have enough, but you just feel like it's an exercise and missing the point. If if there's anyone here today who'd say, you know what? I'm going to do it. You know, again, this has nothing to do with buying gifts or not buying gifts. Buy buy any gift you want. I don't care how expensive it is. Um, but, but if you just want to say to God today, say to yourself today, hey, this year, I'm going to try a little bit harder to focus more on Jesus this Christmas, to focus more on his gift. And I'm going to figure out some creative ways to do that. If that's you today, would you just kind of slip your hand up? I'm going to try to just focus a little more on Jesus. Yeah, I see your hand. Amen. Amen. Any more? Amen. Yeah, I see him. Thank you. Amen. And so, God, today, I just, uh, we want to recognize that this is real. God, this, this stress and pressure and struggle of the whole, we give gifts and presents, and there's cost and expense, and some of the things we can't even afford. What do you do with all that? 
And, and for many of us, God, even in this room right now, we just feel incredible weight on our shoulders. And Father, even for those of us who have a little more capacity, it's still weighty because for some of us, we just want people desperately to see and experience you and instead of that new electronic gadget that'll be outdated in three months. So Lord, I just pray that today, um, as, as we get ready to leave this place, God, that you would help us to focus on the reality that our Savior is here. And God, as we sing this closing song today, uh, the song that we already sang, what a powerful song. May this be a declaration that, that we don't want to focus on the gift that we want or the thing we would like to be able to afford to give to someone else, but God, help us to focus on our Savior who is here, here and now, because Jesus is the only one that changes everything. So Lord, as, as we stand together now and as we sing this song as our final declaration this morning, I just pray that you would lock something powerful into our hearts that would set us free from, from the weight of gold and this temptation to the dark side. We ask these things together in Jesus' name. Amen.